tell us a little bit about your story? Well, I think that I had the blessing to have been born in a country that puts so much emphasis on beauty and external beauty and body shape and being beautiful because I'm from Venezuela. Um, that I, you, you grow up very self-conscious, you know, it's part of our culture, it's part of, I always tell people out of there that it's who we are, we cannot change it, you know, we, we grow up wanting to be Miss Venezuela, but I was always overweight. Um, my, the, my issues with food started when my parents divorced, I was six, but since before that I have always, I think that food was the thing that I control. Food was the, the one thing that nobody could take from me, you know. Um, so I gained a lot of weight, and I started, I think I did my first diet when I was seven. Um, I remember we went to a, a pediatrician, and I started a low-fat, high-fiber diet. Um, and because you, you are you're a child, right, so you, you don't want to be eating really bad food. <laughs> and on diets, while your friends are beautiful and perfect, and you look at yourself, and you could see this flaw, like this flaw body on you, right? Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, from then onwards, my body, oh, my weight always fluctuated. Um, if we have a big, like when I graduated from, from high school, I lost quite a lot of weight. That's when I started uh, with uh, eating disorders, not eating for days, uh, and then binging and all doing all these mind games. So I remember I would, I would go walk from my home to McDonald's and get a bunch of like the 20 nuggets box mm -hmm. and a burger and I will eat and then I will throw up and, and this this whole messed up game that I started, right? Um, and then I did a lot of acting. I, I, I love theater. I, I was a theater actress. And um, that, that made things even more messed up because I knew that I had this ideal, right? And, and I always had a role, and I, my husband always says that you know, you were never that, but I, I, I always call myself a triple F, funny fat friend. Um, that was my role. I will be hilarious. I will, I will make fun of myself. But inside, I was always really, um, I was sad. I, I always thought that I was going to end up alone because I was fat, because I was, I was flawed, because I saw myself flaw. Um, when I, and then um, I was going to study acting at the end. I studied journalism. Mm -hmm. So I went to college with all these Miss Venezuela rejects. And I kid you not. On the first day when they ask you, so you're here to become a journalist, what is your dream? Most of them say, I just want to be on TV. And they were beautiful, tall, beautiful, gorgeous. And here I am, 5'3", overweight. Mm -hmm. um, thank God I had good skin. I never had acne. But, you know, and, and seeing myself as, as this rigid. Um, and so I, I stopped eating. I started smoking. I stopped eating. Um, I drank massive amounts of Diet Coke. Smoke a lot, not eat, and then I lost weight. And, and at this time, between my senior year in high school and college, I did a lot of that. So my weight fluctuated like between like 20 kilos. Mm -hmm. I would go, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I had a meltdown at some point, and I was actually hospitalized for it. Um, and then I think that I just let go. I had plastic surgery when I was 20. Um, so I have breast enhancement and tummy tuck because I had lost weight so badly that I had, they cut 30 centimeters of loose skin. I could just pull it up and go, blop, 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 blop. Um, and I mean, me light bulb, uh, at 20. Um, yeah, I look better, but I felt the same. And that look better lasted probably a year, maybe. I had a very abusive relationship in that time. I was kind of with a really, really mind-controlling person. And by the time I moved to Argentina, just graduated from college, um, I have already gained probably as much, if not more, than the way that I had when I went into surgery, right? So all the effort. I remember I think that I, get, I, I got into surgery weighing something like 75, 78 kilos. Mm -hmm. And in Argentina, I got close to 90. And then I just kept escalating. Um, in Argentina, the one thing good that happened when I lived there is that I discovered who I was. I realized 
I think that we we might go through layers throughout life, you know, peeling layers, and then suddenly you realize, oh, this is who I am now. Um, and then five years or two years or whatever later, you peel another layer, and oh, this is who I am now. And and it's that's one of the biggest layers that I discovered was there. Um, I was single for the first time because that's another thing that my culture has is that not only you have to look hot, you have to look hot because you need to have a man. If you don't have a man and you are not pretty, you know, um, but I was single. I was figuring out who I wanted to be in life. I, it was the first time that I, I actually started thinking of myself as more than just the shell. Um, but I didn't care my way. I kept on smoking. I kept on eating pretty much anything on my side. And then I moved to Qatar to be with my mother, and I got into another abusive relationship. And after that, uh, my weight was just out of control. It was probably the highest that I had been and the most miserable. I was so depressed and so, so, so bad. So after years of trying the new fat diet, I did pineapple diet, soup diets, cabbage diet, which, by the way, I don't recommend it to anybody, especially if you're married. Ugh. I did... <laughs> All sorts of things. I took pills. Mm -hmm. I would convince my mom. I would be like, please, mom, please, just, please, just last time, just please take me to this doctor. Or please, let's do this treatment. Or please let me do these massages. I had ma massages done that it was so hard that I had bruising all over my body for weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. And it would be the same. I would lose five kilos. I will let go. I will gain weight. I will gain 10, you know. And, and on this day, I remember it was November five years ago, so in so the moment 2010, I was, that's it. I cannot carry on this way. Um, I come from a broken marriage. Um, I was in a job that was kind of dead end, but I liked. I knew that it, it wasn't, but, but everything else was just falling to pieces. And I did that set. Um, we're gonna make this, I'm gonna make this happen. And I'm, I'm gonna change my diet and I'm going to start exercising. Something that is scary because I hate it. The idea of sweating mm -hmm. just makes me cringe. I'll go, oof, anything but sweating. Um, but I, and this time it wasn't because by this day I want to have lost 50 kilos like before. Yes. This time was like, I'm just going to give myself a year. I'm just going to give myself a year to figure out what the heck is going to be my life. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Who am I going to become? Um... And that's it, that was November. 12 December, no, 21 December, I met my now husband. That's a different story. Um, but anyway, in this process, I just I just stopped looking for the quick fix. I stopped thinking, this time I'm gonna have a pill and within two weeks, and I stopped Googling Kim Kardashian's latest milkshake. Mm -hmm. And I just went for, this is not working. I was taking pills for migraines pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. I was having an asthma attack in my sleep. So I wake up with an asthma attack, searching for the Ventolin because I couldn't breathe. I was having all sorts of stomach problems. So I had like um, colitis, esophagitis, gastritis. I had an upper ulcer, which my doctor said that within five years will be cancer. Um, I had everything mm -hmm. and I still felt flaw. Um, so I started changing. And it all started with normal counting calorie things. I think I read a book about calories in versus calories out, you lose weight, and that's how it started. I remember in this time, the first few months I didn't lose weight, and I was like, that's it, my body's broken. I just, I better just get fatter and just let go and become a nun or something, like a fat, fat, unhappy nun or something. Um, but fortunately, by then I was dating already my now husband, Phil, and he just said, just push a little bit harder. Just before you go to a doctor, just stay there. Just carry on. Um, I started training like from zero times per week to five times per week, two to three hours. I started liking it. I started feeling, okay, this is happening. And then the weight started to come off. And within almost two years, I have lost 25 kilos. Um, but it was good because this time it wasn't, I didn't have a, 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 a timeline. I didn't have a, by this day you have to be thin. I had a, I really need to look and feel as I want to feel. I hadn't changed anything of my, my mind thing, but I was, I think I was better. 
Anyway, I got engaged. Um, in this process, as, as I started losing weight and changing my diet, it was really, the flaw that I see now is the fact that I was still eating these packets, these 100 calories packs, because to me, calories were all that matter. So I will have this skinny cow treat. Um, I will count all my calories and stuff, um, which wasn't very fun. But I love doing it because, again, food was my control. I couldn't control everything. I couldn't control the fact that my fiancé lived really far from me. I couldn't control the fact that when we were planning our wedding, our priest died. I couldn't control so many. I know. <laughs> Funky. I know. I couldn't control so many things, but I could control my calorie intake. And that's what I focus all my energy. And I control it really, really well. I had all these apps and stuff. And I was like, that's it. I'm, this is it. I'm done. Um, I still took pills. I didn't take as many as before. My asthma had improved a lot, but my diet wasn't perfect. Um, anyway, then I met Nicole Van Hatten, who was my health coach in that process when I was planning my wedding and leaving Qatar and quitting and doing all these things. And she kind of gave me an extra push because she kind of moved me from calories are all that matter, you need to look thin, to sustenance real food matters more try different things and then I started just getting I think I get very intense it's like when I did theater I will I will do theater I will leave theater. it was like theater um and then I got when, when I got into this it was like wellness woohoo and if you see my Facebook it goes from like very artificial mm -hmm. things like cats and stuff and then it's like wellness and now that I'm a mom it's like motherhood so I think that I just get very intense um, and I just started watching documentaries we all started uh, my whole family my mom has a condition called Jorgen syndrome um, among other couple of things which is an autoimmune condition and um, just when I had we, I got married I moved out of Qatar into Abu Dhabi with my husband we decided that we're gonna leave Abu Dhabi and we're gonna go to the UK and all this process um, my mom says, why don't you come with me to, the, to my doctor, to my rheumatologist, just to see if there's something we could do. And this was the key. This was the beginning of my change. Um, I have already enrolled to study in IIN to become a wellness coach, mm -hmm. but I wasn't completely there yet. I was still thinking that all you needed to do is thin. You needed to be fit, right? And that time, that doctor was amazing, and he actually told us, well, try to add more anti antioxidants and stuff. And down the rabbit hole I went. From there, and IIN, it just started a slow process of me realizing the importance of nourishment um, and nutrients within our health and within our everything, right? Um, so it all started like that. And then when we were three months married, I was pregnant. And, and so, yeah, I had a... I had a really uncomplicated pregnancy, happy pregnancy, everything in my son was born, and I had really, really low milk supply, I had postnatal depression, and suddenly the one part of my body that was always to blame for my weight, but was never found guilty, like the OJ part of my body, <laughs> my thyroid finally came out positive as not working well. Mm -hmm. So after pretty much, I think, 20 years wishing for my thyroid to be the one to blame because that was the, the one that all doctors always said, you're fat because your thyroid is not working. But we cannot find it. This time, they found it. And they diagnosed me with Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune um, hypothyroid. And that was it. Uh, my son, by six weeks, was malnourished. Because as a first time mom, I didn't know that he was not skinny. He was really just under calories. Um, and I didn't want to give him formula. So we started to start supplementing that roller coaster. My postnatal depression even worse because I felt, I felt like I was failing him and failing my husband and failing my whole family. How could I be a wellness coach when I couldn't even feed my son naturally? Um, I gained weight. So in I... I didn't gain much weight when I was pregnant. I actually gained 12 kilos from week two mm -hmm. of having him to week 12. So in 10 weeks, I gained all that weight. I, my body went just berserk. Um, and I think that that was the last push I needed. That's when I went from being a health coach, mm -hmm. focused on primary foods, to being a 
I don't know, badass wellness coach focusing on every nutrient that you need and every part of your life that needs to be aligned for you to truly feel well. And that's when my, my approach changed completely to my holistic nourishment approach, which is how what I do now. Um, and so there I was, first time mom, everything was perfect. I was living back in Qatar where I wanted to live with a fantastic husband, a beautiful baby that was now gaining weight thanks to formula. Um, still breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. I'm still today breastfeeding, even though I'm pregnant. We, we kept doing it. Um, but I was completely miserable. I was planning to leave my husband. I was Googling how to leave my husband a newborn. Um, and I wanted to become a nun again. The, the nun thing comes back and forth. And I was just, I'm just going to join a nun. And I had all these plans that I was going to leave them because I couldn't couldn't find a way to function as a mother um and then one day when my son was around eight months um my husband confronted me and he said i think that you have postnatal depression don't take it this wrong way but i really think we need to do something about it and suddenly it was like oh yeah so motherhood doesn't suck oh wow and it all Again, it all started changing. I started doing nutrient therapy for these. Um, I started seeing a coach myself, um, sorting myself out. And and today, when my son is 23 months mm-hmm. um, and I'm pregnant with number two, mm-hmm. uh, things are completely different. Uh, I think the, the, the thing is that for the first time now, I can see that the, the thing is not, the, the value is not, on what I do, or how much I weight, or how the size of my pants, but in me. Mm-hmm. Um, in all this, I'm, st- I, I'm still a work in progress. I think we're all work in progress. Um, there's still a lot of guilt. Um, there are moments where I see Matthew naked, and I go, oh, it was so freaky, we could have lost him. Um, there are moments where we, people ask me, are you going to attend the nurse? And I'm like, dude, I barely could nurse this one. I don't know if I'm, you know... Um, but now I don't, I don't look for perfection because that's the thing. I wanted the perfect body or the perfect boyfriend or the perfect life. Well, I'm never going to have it because I'm already there. I'm already perfect. This is perfect. Perfect is way more with this pregnancy than with Matthew, but feeling better. Perfect is screwing it up sometimes. And perfect is eating sometimes gluten-free junk because it's the best option. My husband says the best available option in an imperfect world. And this is the thing. We live in an imperfect, flaw world. And perfect has become accepting it and letting go and saying, all right, let's just roll with it. Um, so my journey has taken me to freaky places. I have I had never imagined that I would become an advocate for depression in womanhood and for the importance of women mental health and awareness and men mental health, everybody's mental health. Um, I never in my life imagined that I would become an advocate for breastfeeding and that I will be writing passionately about the need for it to make sure that our kids have the optimal chances to have the best gene expression they can. I never in my life imagined that I would end up reading about genetics and epigenetics and the importance of nourishment. But here I am. And I love it. And I love the fact that my depression, my struggles, my issues, my cries, my kilos, my diets, my craziness is what is enabling me to help others, to help moms, to help women, to help men, to help kids, to help anybody who will listen Mm -hmm. to regain the control of their wellness and their life and their health and, and to say, well, that's it. Life is more than this because we all deserve big, beautiful healthy, nourished lives. And that's, that's the thing. That's, that's the thing that I always thought that I could only have the perfect life if I waited this, if I was thin enough or nice enough or sweet enough or smart enough or if I was just perfect enough. And now I just realize that I am enough. I have always been enough. Um, and I have a message and I am very passionate about it. And I am in your face or vocal about it because I do think that we need to take back our health we need to take back our life and we need to make sure that that we carry on with evolution we need to stop with this 
dragging ourselves around life and around health when we are we deserve more than that. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> what is the type of people that come looking for you? Um, mostly women. Um, I'm very selective. I only I only work with women, and I I tend to choose mostly moms, mm -hmm. um, because I live in Qatar. My one-on-one -on -one, um, clients tend to be that moms, especially young moms. That are kind of my, my in my situation they have kids but they just want to be moms they don't just want to be housewives but they're just in that transitioning um right now but i'm i'm opening up more to to just empowering more women so that's probably my thing okay and what what rewards you the most with this practice now <clears throat> i love i love the the opportunity to enlighten an aha moment, to start an aha moment. I love when I say something and suddenly a client, a Facebook follower, whoever just goes, oh, wow, mm -hmm. because we need that. Yeah. Sometimes I hear something on the radio, a son or whatever, and I go, oh, wow. So I like to, to ignite that, those aha moments in others. You enjoy their faces when they, something clicks. Yeah. Everything you know what? I, I, I really... I really love talking to others mm -hmm. about how easy it is to let go of the things that we think that are really hard. And when you break paradigms and when you tell them doctors are just professionals, you can you know yourself better than anybody else. And they go, oh, hang on a minute. That mm -hmm. might be, yeah, well, well I like that. <laughs> yeah, that might be true. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and what challenges you the most with clients? Part. I think the ownership part. I think we are we are so used to our, our culture is so used to always blaming outside. So you blame the doctors, or you blame the lack of doctors, or you blame the pill, or you blame the, the government. You always have someone to blame, mm -hmm. um, and it is when you tell them that's it. You know, it's your life, it's your diet, it's your body, it's your problem. So you have to man up and you know, or woman up or whatever and start changing things and they go no but and there are moments that I'm very rough and I'm like no I mean if you're gonna come with excuses you you're wasting your time and mine you need to come knowing that it's gonna be hard but it's gonna be fun mm -hmm. so carry on okay. it's, a, it's a, a tough approach <laughs> well sometimes you have to because I am very funny and loving and all that and I can be very nourishing but I'm not gonna babysit anybody I only babysit my son um, I'm not going to be, I mean, you, you, yes, it's true, you can eat McDonald's from time to time and you're going to, no, mm -hmm. if you eat rubbish, you're going to feel like rubbish, your body's worth more than that, so it's that, yeah, <laughs> <Little slaps. laughs> yeah, I'm Catholic, so sometimes we do, come on, <laughs> I know. and could you describe your practice in one word, the way you have empowering, it? empowering, why empowering? Um, because that's what I like to do. I, I don't want, I don't want them to depend on me. I want people to feel strong and empowered and knowledgeable enough about themselves and their families to change their life for the best. And I, I want them from then on, like after they finish a, a cycle with me to just say, well, that's it. I don't need anybody else. I can read labels myself. I can research myself. I can nourish myself. Yeah, because the thing is that um, we're so we're, we're used to that. We're used to depending on someone, a therapist, a coach, a doctor, a lawyer, someone. I don't want that. I want them to leave me knowing that they can always call me if they need me, but that they are, they're cool. Mm -hmm. I, I learned that even from my homeopath. I remember when she said, I, I don't want you calling me every five minutes whenever Matthew gets sick. And I was like, you need to help me. You need to help me. And then I start reading about it, and now I never call her, I never bother her, not because I don't love her, I, I love her, she's fantastic, but because it's my health, it's my son's health, it's, it's our family, we take care of it, you know. We don't, we don't need to depend on stuff, we are empowered. Is it easy now that you are um, a 
away from from your culture it's it's do you see a difference i don't know i don't i've been out of venezuela for nine years mm -hmm. um and my mother for no eight and my mother for almost nine and i i don't think that you ever leave it mm -hmm. you never leave your culture i still i still do my makeup i don't do it every day i don't know every day mm -hmm. i didn't know <laughs> um, but I still, it's important for me. Um, I think there are some things that are embedded in me, mm -hmm. and that's going to be very difficult. And you know what? The thing is, I don't want to change it. You know, it's like my husband says that I'm, he says, there are moments like you're so Latina, you're so, so Latina, so Caribbean, and, and feisty, and, and, and there are moments that you're so English, you're so, I get so, like, righteous indignation, and I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, and that's it. That's me, right? That the, I think that the hardest part now is when I look at my family, my friends, and the people there, and I don't get it because it hits me. Oh my God, I'm so different now. And I go, oh, will I ever be able to go back there? You know, that that's the hard part. Yeah, but but uh, I meant like in a besides your personality or who you are about the culture like if you try to help someone from the same um, culture well, to, to think because I've, I have friends from Venezuela too that how they put so many value on how they look yeah so. I think I can I it's easier for me to understand to that to, to understand that than, and relate and and it's also it's it's easier for me to, to tell them that they don't have to live that way. Um, it is freaky. It is very freaky. Um, I, when I was pregnant with Matthew, we always thought that it was going to be a boy, but my biggest fear would be for him to be a girl mm -hmm. because of that. I thought, I just don't want her to ever have to experience the ridiculous amount of stupidity that we put with when it comes to our physical appearance mm -hmm. and now I'm pregnant and I don't know but we all think that it's a girl and all I could think of is piercing the ears mm -hmm. you know in Venezuela kids girls come out with the ears pierced and I always say well would you do it that's what you do yeah, you do it mm -hmm. and and when we talk about Matthew's circumcision and stuff my husband was like well you don't do it you leave it you don't mess with their body it's their body and it has to be whole and if he wants to be circumcised later we'll do it later and it makes sense. And then I started researching about it in a sense. Piercing the ears mm -hmm. is the first time that I realized that I'm against the culture because last time someone asked me, if it's a girl, are you gonna pierce her ears? And I was like, no, it's her body. And it was such a, I don't know, ice bucket mm -hmm. in my face realization that suddenly I'm like, I'm gonna go against something that is really into my culture. So, yeah, I'm going to see how we're going to navigate. If it's a girl, I'm going to see how we're going to navigate the whole makeup and waxing and <sighs> breast surgery, yeah. which girls do so early, and plastic surgery in general, and wanting to be a mix. I still say things like that. The other day I was telling Phil, if it's a girl with your height, my face, your blue eyes, she's going to be Miss England. And Phil is like, Really? That's what you're wishing for our girl, but it comes out, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, I was trying to explain. I was like, well, the UK, like England, has never had like a. You guys have very little Miss Universe crowns. <laughs> I mean, we can. And he, he's like, we don't care. It's not like that. And I'm like, you have to care a little bit. Come on. <laughs> so that still comes out of my mouth, and I go, <gasps> okay. Yeah, I better not say that. <laughs> well, it's good. it's going to be interesting how you how you manage. At least you're you're not in Venezuela and you're not in in Britain, so it's yeah, a different place away from both. I'm, and I'm happy for that. Mm -hmm. I'm happy because I think that childhood gets over gets it's so quick in Venezuela. At least girls and boys go from being kids to being sexualized objects teenagers and the culture is very sexual and I'm actually happy mm -hmm. that we're away from that because if I have a girl I don't want any of that you know I don't want the short shorts 
when they're like 10. Mm -hmm. I don't want high heels at seven. I want a little girl for as long as I can keep her. Yes. So yeah, I, in that I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Well, thank you for the interview. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to add something else? Oh, well, I really, I cannot wait to read this book. I cannot wait to get a lot of people with their hands in them. And I do hope that this gives us a chance to empower more people, to support more people, and to start a movement to change the world because I think that's, that's what we're doing. Let's just make this, let's just make humans amazing again. Thank you. From me, you know. Um, so I gained a lot of weight. And I started, I think I did my first day when I was seven. Um, I remember we went to a, a pediatrician and I started a low fat, high fiber diet. Um, and because you you are you are a child, right? So you you don't want to be eating really bad food. <laughs> and on diets, while your friends are beautiful and perfect, and you look at yourself and you could see this flaw, like this flaw body on you, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, from then onwards, my body, my weight always fluctuated. Um, if we have a big, like when I graduated from, from high school, I lost quite a lot of weight. That's when I started uh, with uh, eating disorders, not eating for days, uh, and then binging and all doing all these mind games. So I remember I would, I would that. So my weight fluctuated like between like 20 kilos. Mm -hmm. I would go, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I had a meltdown at some point and I was actually hospitalized for it. Um, and then I think that I just let go. I had plastic surgery when I was 20. Mm -hmm. um, so I had breast enhancement and tummy tuck because I had lost weight so badly that I had, they cut 30 centimeters of loose skin. I could just pull it up and go blop, 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 blop. Um, and I'm in the light bulb uh, at 20. Um, yeah, I look better but I felt the same. Mm -hmm. And that look better lasted probably. So, Anna, could you tell us a little bit about your story? Well, I think that I had the blessing to have been born in a country that puts so much emphasis on beauty and external beauty and body shape and being beautiful because I'm from Venezuela. Um, that I, you, you grow up very self-conscious, you know, it's part of our culture, it's part of, I always tell people out of there that it's who we are, we cannot change it, you know, we, we grow up wanting to be Miss Venezuela, but I was always overweight. Um, my, the, my issues with food started when my parents divorced, I was six, but since before that I have always, I think that food was the thing that I control. Food was the, the one thing that nobody could take from when I, and then um, I was going to study acting at the end. I studied journalism. Mm -hmm. So I went to college with all these Miss Venezuela rejects. And I kid you not, on the first day when they ask you, so you're here to become a journalist, what is your dream? Most of them say, I just want to be on TV. And they were beautiful, tall, beautiful, gorgeous. And here I am, 5'3", overweight. Mm -hmm. um, thank God I had good skin. I never had acne. But, you know, and, and seeing myself as this, rigid um and so i i stopped eating i start smoking i stopped eating um i drank massive amounts of diet coke smoke a lot not eat and then i lost weight and and at this time be between my senior year in high school and college i did a lot of the go walk from my home to mcdonald's and get a bunch of like the 20 nuggets box mm -hmm. and a burger and i will eat and then i'll throw up and and this this whole messed up game that I started, right? Um, and then I did a lot of acting. I, 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 I love theater. I, I was a theater actress. And um, that, that made things even more messed up because I knew that I had this ideal, right? And, and I always had a role, and I, my husband always says that you're no, you were never that, but I, I, I always call myself a triple F, funny fat friend. Um, that was my role. I will be hilarious. I will, I will make fun of myself. But inside, I was always really 
um, I was sad. I, I always thought that I was going to end up alone because I was fat, because I was, I was flawed, because I saw myself flawed. Um, 